Okay, it's two minutes past the hour, so I'm going to get started. Um, we've got a lot to cover in today's webinar, so um, let's get going. Hello, everyone. I'm Alison Hendricks. I'm the founder and CEO of Simply Stakeholders. I worked in stakeholder engagement for many years, um, advising government and industry on stakeholder engagement processes and started this company really out of my own frustration of not having decent tools to manage the lar large amount of data that we sent, seem to generate through these processes and you know, not having good analysis tools or ways to get some meaningful insights out of the data. Um, that was quite a few years ago. And um, today, DARS and the Simply Stakeholders are, are two platforms are used by governments and industry all around the world in multiple sectors. But we do have quite a large contingent of government clients who are in particular who are working on policy development processes or um, designing and delivery of uh, large scale programs. And that could be programs that range anything from um, grant management programs to implementation of health um, or service delivery programs. Um, and we've noticed some common themes in there. So that's why we decided to have this webinar to talk about this particular sort of sector of um, stakeholder engagement. So today I'm not going to be talking to you from a perspective of, you know, what is a good policy necessarily, like a policy expert or or even a project management expert. I'm really looking at this um, area of practice with the stakeholder engagement and stakeholder management lens. So um, as we all know, um, good stakeholder engagement can make or break a project. No matter what type of project it is, stakeholder engagement is so critical to success. So we're particularly gonna take a focus on the stakeholder engagement and stakeholder management component of delivering good policy or programs. Um, today's session is going to be quite interactive. There's going to be a poll, there's going to be some questions asked of you in the chat, and it's always most interesting for um, the other participants. We've got people um, dialing in from all over the world, uh, lots of different sectors, and you know, welcome. We're really thrilled you could join us. Um, but it's always most interesting when people can um, participate and um, we make the session interactive. So there's going to be times um, throughout the session where I'm going to ask you for comments. Please um, do give us your thoughts. Okay. So the agenda for today, we're going to start off looking at some of the particular challenges that policy and program delivery faces. Um, you know, it's, uh, I think stakeholder engagement can be challenging no matter what sector, but there are some unique challenges this sector faces. So we'll look at that. We'll then look at what does um, constitute success <clears throat> Excuse me. How do we define success? What are the appropriate success measures to determine whether, sorry, <coughs> to determine whether a policy, um, you know, and program delivery process has been successful or not? Um, I'm hoping to have some time to go through a couple of case studies with you, and then we'll finish off with some best practice tips. So that's the agenda for today. And um, first up, I'm going to ask you, I'm going to start this little poll. Um, I'd like to know what your interest is in um, this session today. Uh, there's some familiar faces and names, but quite a few of you are new to me. So I'd love to know what, you know, what you're coming in for. So um, hopefully you can all see the poll. It should be in your little dialog box on the right. Um, so, so far we're looking like a lot of general stakeholder engagement. Any of you working in policy or program delivery? I'll give you one more minute to respond. And okay, we've got a nice mix here. Let's, um, hmm. I thought it would allow me to just show you the poll results, but we've got 33% um, who are working in policy, 16% interested in program design and delivery, and 50% in general stakeholder engagement. So brilliant. Thank you so much for that. All right. That helps me know where to focus the efforts in today's session. 
So let's start off looking at some of the challenges. And this is very wordy, I, I apologise, but there's so many. Um, I think, as I mentioned before, the area of policy and program development have some really particular and unique challenges. I think measuring, you know, um, to start off with, there's hardly any discussion ever about, you know, good policy or programs. It tends to focus on, you know, the political aspects. Did I like the policy? Therefore, it was a success, as opposed to looking at the process of developing policy and implementing it, right? So there's very little sort of um, evaluation done or, or even discussion about, you know, successes and failures. So I think there's, there's a particular lack of benchmarks of success. I think stakeholder engagement in general suffers from a lack of benchmarks and industry standards, but particularly so in this area of practice. I think some of the challenges for it as well is that, um, you know, when you're looking at some of these large scale policies and programs, the impacts may not be apparent for quite a long time. There's short term impacts, long term in impacts, and there's also always some unintended consequences. So how do we actually judge the impacts of a policy to determine if it was successful or not? There, this work is almost always done in a highly politicised environment. There's always some very strong vested interests, very polarised interests. That makes it quite challenging, right, to do stakeholder engagement in that sort of environment. Um, this sort of work attracts a lot of submissions and often they're very complex submissions. That's a challenge in terms of how does the agency deal with those submissions? How do you analyse them and, and how do you utilise that information? There's often limitations on what can be influenced. You know, going back to that, um, um, you know, issue of it being so politicised, there's often very limited um, range of things that can be influenced, right? This is all driven politically. And sometimes changes as a result of stakeholder involvement are not necessarily seen as a success, right? So in, in a traditional stakeholder management or stakeholder engagement process, one of the ways we look to measure the success of the process is to say, how much was it able to influence? Did it improve the project? Did it shape the project? Did it change things? And in a policy context or program delivery context, that's not necessarily either possible or necessarily a good thing, right? Sometimes changes are made at the last minute to appease one of the vested interests. And um, perhaps those changes are not as well thought out and could lead to a whole lot of other unintended consequences. So, you know, is, is that a valid measure of success then to say that we change the policy based on feedback? You know, there's a question, right? I'm, I'm not saying it's necessarily good or bad. It really depends. And I think when we look at the stakeholder engagement process around, you know, complex policy development process, for example, it's particularly challenging um, in today's environment where so much of it has to be done online. Um, you run into all sorts of issues of um, literacy, right? So we're dealing with very complex issues. People need a higher degree of literacy to be able to understand that information online and then participate meaningfully. So how do we actually address those challenges in this context? Um, and then how do we, you know, all comes down to how do we measure success? Um, how do we distinguish between the programmatic performance of the, you know, the policy um, and its um, political legitimacy? Right, so um, some, some pretty unique challenges, as you can see. So next I'm going to ask you to write in the chat function, you know, if, you, if some of those challenges resonate for you, are they some of the things that you encounter in your work or are there some other challenges that you would like to share with us? So I'm going to give you a couple of minutes to pop a note in the chat to let us know. Samuel says, all of the above, <laughs> yes. Uh, yes, Gil, we'll, we'll share some information at the end of the session. I'm sure the team will um, be sending things out. How about the rest of you, those of you working in policy in particular? Does this resonate? Does this feel like some of the challenges you encounter? I think everyone's been very shy. Perhaps it's too early in the morning or too late where, where you guys are at. 
Okay, that's a good one. Where, where and how to measure and benchmarks for success before, beyond general improvement. Great. Well, I hopefully I'm going to have some ideas here that you could take away from this session and implement in your practice. Okay, feel free to keep adding your comments to the chat, but we'll keep going because there's quite a lot I want to, um, to cover today. Well, here's a comment from Manoj just before I move on. Uh, changes and expectations lead to complexity, but change if taken through an integrated change management process, carefully readdressing impact on scope, time, cost. Yes, and then revising the baseline. Very, very true. Changing expectation is very true. Wilfred says vested interests. Yeah, I think those vested interests quite often are hijacking the process, right? The best plans are often kind of... Um, yeah, really hijacked by, by some of the vested interests. Great, thank you for that. Okay, so let's look at what is success? How do we actually define success in this context, right? Um, I think if, there, if you do have any success measures that you currently use, I'd love it if you could pop it in the, um, in the chat function. Samuel says, you know, capacity building in agencies. Yeah, let's, let's pop it in because this, look, this is, um, you know, when we run these webinars with Simply Stakeholders, we're really kind of looking to gather input from you as well. We're trying to build information that's going to be useful to our industry, right? So um, please share your expertise and experience with, with the rest of us. So pop a note in the chat if there is something you use. I came across this definition of successful policy that I really liked. This, um, these authors, Joanna, Michael and Paul, um, put out a report in December of last year and we can send you a link to the report. It's quite an interesting, it's very academic, but you know, I like this definition because they, and I'll read it out. It, it says a, a policy is a complete success to the extent that A, it demonstrably creates widely valued social outcomes through B, design, decision-making and delivery processes that enhance both its problem-solving capacity and its political legitimacy. And it, C, sustains this performance for a considerable period of time, even in the face of changing circumstances. So the things I really like in this definition is that it talks about sort of valued social outcomes. So what the policy actually delivers. It talks about the process and the design, you know, the decision-making process, um, the delivery process, and they talk about the process itself need, needing to drive that sort of improvement in problem solving and political legitimacy. And then it talks about that sustained long term performance and, and that it's able to weather those storms of changing circumstances. So it's a really nice definition. And those same authors created this um, a policy success assessment map. Now, this is my kind of... Um, slightly modified version of it and interpretation of it, right? But I'd encourage you to look at the original um, report and see the full um, map that they've created. It is more academic, right? So I'm looking at it from the perspective of how can we take some of this information and make it useful and implementable in our stakeholder engagement kind of practice. So it's got four pillars to their assessment of success. There's programmatic assessment, process assessment, political assessment, and temporal assessment. So when they're looking at programmatic assessment, they're talking about purposeful and valued action, right? And so uh, key to success from a programmatic point of view is that there's a public value proposition at the heart of the policy, that there's been considerable movement to, towards achieving the intended outcomes and or perhaps other beneficial social outcomes as well and that costs and benefits are distributed equitably within society. Okay, so that's looking from a programmatic point of view. If we look at it from a process point of view, they talk about, um, you know, the process needing to be deliberative. Um, you'd probably be familiar with the concept of deliberative engagement. Um, if you're not, have a look on our website. We have lots of resources on that as well. Um, but the idea of deliberative uh, democracy or de deliberative engagement is that, um, you know, you or lots of views are considered and people deliberate all of the options and, and come to, you know, uh, an informed decision, right? So they, uh, so I like the fact that they bring in deliberation. And I should say that these guys are not looking at this from a stakeholder 
um, management or stakeholder engagement process, they're true policy wonks, right? They're looking at this from what is a good policy or program delivery. So it's really interesting for me that some of these um, concepts of stakeholder engagement are so prominent in their map and their assessment, right? So they talk about the process needing to deliberative, thoughtful consideration of the different values and interests, hierarchy of goals and objectives, contextual constraints, capacities, and you know, effective implementation. And interestingly, that stakeholders experience, um, the experience stakeholders state of, of the actual process is that it's fair and just. On the political assessment side, they talk about um, stakeholder and public legitimacy for the policy, right? So that, that there is a broad and deep political coalition that supports the policy's value proposition and the current results. That association with the policy enhances people's political cap capital. They want to be associated with it because it's successful, right? Because they see that as enhancing their own personal political capital. And that it enhances the organization's reputation uh, you know, of the various public agencies. On the temporal assessment, it's really looking at that sort of enduring value that it creates. So has it been flexible to adapt to on the ground kind of um, issues that it's encountered, um, changing circumstances, and, and also adapting to performance feedback, um, the degree to which it's been able to be sustained and maintained over time, and the degree to which it confers legitimacy on the broader political system itself, right? So it's a really nice framework, I think, and um, you know has lots of things that we can use in our um, you know practice of stakeholder engagement. Manoj makes a great point. What about technological assessment? I think so. Look, I think um, this is kind of looking at it partially from a stakeholder. I mean, for me, what I've taken out of it is a stakeholder engagement perspective of saying, how do we design, you know, the, whether policy has delivered value and has done it in a, in, a, in a good way that kind of offers benefits equitably across society. The technology is an enabler of that process. It's not necessarily a thing that should be assessing itself. So like I said earlier on, I'm not looking at this from a project management assessment framework. And, and that in the project management assessment, I think you would definitely look at the tools and technologies used, um, perhaps less so in this, but you know, I'm, I'm definitely open to, to considering that and, and looking into that some more. So thank you for that, that suggestion. So how do we take something like that success map and you know, use it in, in that stakeholder engagement context of how we're gonna measure our success? So first of all, let's look at the policy itself. You know, um, I think if evaluation is done in this sector, it tends to be to focus on the process, how many people participated and, um, you know, what was the engagement like? But what if we actually, you know, as you saw in those earlier def definitions, they're talking about the actual policy itself delivering value. So what would be some metrics that we could put in place to, to evaluate that, right? So perhaps is the strategic direction that the policy is offering, the level of adoption and acceptance by stakeholders, by a wide range of stakeholders, um, the implementation, was it implementable? You know, sometimes we can create great policies, but very hard to implement. So that should be a factor, right? Because at the end of the day, we, you know, it's no good having a policy that's so difficult to implement without sort of massive um, unintended consequences. Then looking at the outcomes that the policy created, both long-term and short-term, intended and unintended, looking at the fairness of the policy itself, social justice and equity. You know, I think that there would be some good measures to evaluate the actual policy itself. I remember what I'm doing here is I'm trying to take it to the next level of saying what are some specific things, right? So a second um, thing we could look at is a process. So in evaluating the process, we could look at how many people were involved in the process. Where did they come from? You know, what was, were they representative of the various stakeholders? How many people commented and made submissions? Who participated? Who didn't participate? Were there any missing voices? But getting into that whole idea of stakeholder analysis, stakeholder mapping, um, are we, you know, are we communicating um, 
uh, all the stakeholders involved in, in the process. How about looking at the quality of the participation and submissions? Um, you know, coming back to that idea that these are complex issues and we need to do some capacity building to help people participate meaningfully, then we really should be looking at what sort of questions did people ask or what comments did they make um, to indicate whether we did adequate um, capacity building? Did they see it as a fair process? It's a question we could ask directly of our stakeholders. You know, how fair did you, see, did you think this process was? And then the implementation process itself should be evaluated, right? There should be a whole lot of measures about how effectively that was done, whether it met milestones, that's all you're getting into your project management side of things. Um, and a question I'd pose to you is, you know, are a higher number of submissions necessarily a sign of success? This is something that we discuss with our government clients quite often when they're embarking on these processes. It's, you know, how are you going to define success? Is it a case that you want to attract as many submissions as possible? Or is it the quality of submissions? You know, what, what is it in the submissions that, that's going to indicate success for you? And I'll come back to that. I'll talk to, talk to that when we look at some of the case studies. The third thing we should look at is the results of the, um, the policy or the program itself. Um, what sort of analysis are we doing? Looking at both quantitative and qualitative measures, and we talked about long-term, short-term, um, but really, you know, when we're analysing those submissions and that feedback, how actionable were those findings? Were we able to use that information? And then also looking at what else did it deliver? Did it you know, deliver legitimacy or advance reputations and confidence in the agency running it. So then if we take it, you know, so stepping through measures and then what would be some key results we could actually, you know, quantify. I, I like the objective key results of framework um, because it, it kind of forces you to really clarify what your objective is and how you'll measure it, you know, in a very quantifiable way. So if we look at an objective, of social justice and fairness. Remember that was one of the definitions, key elements of the definitions of you know, the success of the policy. Um, what does social justice and fairness look like? What would be one of the objectives? Um, you know, so uh, stepping aside from the policy itself um, being socially just and fair, um, what about our process in developing and implementing that process? Um, could we, determine whether we were contributing to social justice and fairness. And perhaps one objective could be that we want to um, create more connected communities through this process, remembering that we're looking at long-term um, impacts as well, right? The policy and the process should add benefits beyond just the policy itself. Right? And so one of the things, uh, the benefit of people um, participating in our processes is that we improve those community connections because we know there's a whole lot of other benefits that come from communi connected communities. There's, you know, healthcare benefits. There's, there's a whole range of things that come from, from that. So, um, so if we break down the objective of social justice and fairness into sub-objectives, one of them might be that we create more connected, better connected communities. And then how do we measure that? Maybe we look at... Um, increasing the participation rates uh, in marginalised communities. we you know, higher than we've had before. So this is the idea also of that continuous improvement, um, that we have an active engagement with, you know, a certain percentage of community representatives. Um, all of those are, are sort of measurable results that will contribute to developing more connected communities. I hope that makes sense uh, of what I'm trying to achieve in this table here. So this is not meant to be a fully comprehensive kind of list of indicators. It was just really just playing with some of the objectives and saying, well, how would we go about breaking them down into measurable outcomes and results? So the next one I had was increased trust, right? How, how will we measure whether we're contributing to that in our policy and program delivery? Um, one of the you know things we can do towards that is publishing regular reports on our website, uh, measuring engagement with certain groups, um, but then also that we, um, you know, overtly ask stakeholders um, what their level of confidence is in the process and the policy itself. If our objective is implementation excellence, um, again, while there's loads of, you know, project management kind of measures you can look at for that, 
some of the things would be from a stakeholder engagement perspective is creating, making sure you have regular plans that review your performance and evaluate it, and that you have quarterly reports um, that you, you know, progress against key milestones or intended outcomes, and that you're actually communicating them to the stakeholders. So remember, remembering that that's a framework we want to um, go back to. Looking at enhanced political capital and reputation, you know, remembering that, you know, if a policy is successful, people want to be associated with with it. So maybe we we track how many people kind of actively in the media and social media are linking themselves to that policy. Um, you know, perhaps that's a great indicator to show us that um, the policy is actually delivering that enhanced social capital. So I've been talking for a long time. I think it's time to ask you some questions. Um, thoughts on that before we dive into looking at some case studies? Give me a chance to have a drink of water too. Any comments you want to add um, into the chat function? Where are we at? I think everybody is being very quiet. Yeah, I, you know, it's it's difficult, right, Gil? How do you get past the sort of it being very academic and having a lot of um, time to evaluate something in, in great depth? And, and that's really what I was trying to do is look at some of those academic studies and say, how can we kind of um, use it in a very practical way in stakeholder engagement? Uh, Manoj says, yes, gone are the days when a lot of data was too much. Yeah, we have definitely lots of data and I think, you know, that, that can be a good thing uh, or a bad thing if it's overwhelming. Okay, next I'm just going to talk about a couple of case studies just quickly. I'm just conscious of time. Um, so the first one I um, wanted to talk about was a large scale strategic plan that a government agency was um, running. Um, and it was looking right across, you know, an entire state. It was looking at, um, you know, what, what should be the priorities um, going forward. So very, you know, quite big picture, but also, as you can imagine, something like that attracted a lot of um, very detailed um, feedback and submissions, lots of vested interest because there were a lot of people, you know, a lot of funding was going to be determined based on this strategic plan. When um, that agency um, got in touch with us and started using our software, they had just started the process, right? So we came in when the process had you know, it was obviously the plan, the draft plan was in place and the process had started to engage with the stakeholders. Um, one of the first things we noticed when we looked at the, they had a feedback form questionnaire that they started mailing out to people and um, sending out, distributing. We looked at the form and we noticed that it didn't have any, um, you know, identifying information because they wanted to encourage participation. So it was, it could be anonymous, it could, people could put their details in, but it didn't really ask them to locate where they were coming from, right? And, and so the magic number that was key to success was to ask people for a postcode. So you could still be anonymous, but by asking for that postcode, they were then able to slice the data, you know, and they got a lot of feedback, they got thousands of um, submissions and feedback, but they were able to slice it by region, by um, political electorate district, by local um, authority, local council area, because the, you know as we know, we have the data. We can we can cut it multiple ways. So what that gave them was a uh, an ability to say the priorities in this particular region were X, Y, and Z. The big concerns were these things. Right, so it, it immediately made the information much more understandable, and um, you know, we luckily we were pretty early in the state in the process, and they were able to reissue um, submission 
forms and survey forms with that postcode field requirement um, and before they got the thousands of um, responses, right? So interestingly, that became so important, not just in the policy, uh, the, the planning process of determining, you know, the priorities and the, the actions to take, but the um, all of the decision makers ended up wanting to see all of the comments from their region, right? They were also able to, to slice the data by different functional areas. So what were the, you know, comments about the environment versus um, policing or, you know, all, all the different kind of um, areas of business of government. Um, and their first reporting to the politicians was to, to give them, you know, a selection, the top 20 comments on that topic. And almost immediately, just about all of them came back and said, well, actually, we'd like to see all the comments. So suddenly you were getting all of the feedback from the stakeholders in their own words directly to the decision maker. Right? Really powerful. That's the power of the qualitative analysis function that our software has, that it can take those words directly to the decision maker. So big, big advantage in getting, you know, the information through, um, big advantage in designing the priorities appropriately by region. But the interesting thing that came later on when they went to implement the plan, because they had to work in partnership with a whole lot of agencies um, like the local councils, local authorities. Um, very interestingly, when they went to impl implement it, um, you know, the first meeting, they basically just ran the feedback based on that local council using that postcode filter. Um, so, um, I'll come back to your question, Gil. Um, they were able to, you know, run the the feedback on, on those things and turn up to that first meeting with the local council and say, here's the feedback from your local community. This is what they want us to do. And um, almost immediately, every, almost every meeting they went to, uh, they told, told me that made, um, people in the meeting would say, hey, that's my comment and you still have that, you know, a year later, a year after I submitted that, and that you're actually still looking at it when it comes to implementing the policy. So in terms of building relationship and trust with the authority that they had to work in partnership with to deliver it, it was a huge win, right? So it ended up being such an important thing for the successful implementation of that plan. So sometimes just thinking through how you can use the information how you plan to use it and what's going to be important for you um, can really help, you know, really change your um, your whole process, I think, and not just in terms of the actual plan itself, but that long term, you know, relationship building, uh, implementation of the, um, the plan. Now, um, Kill's comments, there are hundreds or more, how best to group them? Yeah, look, in, in this case study, they did have a few hundred responses that had already come in on the first form that didn't have that locator information. So I think the, the team did their best to try and locate them. Sometimes people do give their address details, so that's easy, but they, they still ended up with a few sort of comments. I mean, they were included in there as part of the general feedback, but um, compared to the thousands that came after that, you know, they were literally... You know, I can't remember the exact numbers right now, but there were thousands of um, submissions that came through. So uh, in that context, it didn't matter. But if you if, if you have, I mean, if it's too late in your process and you've got lots of data, um, trickier to do that analysis, right? You really need to look at the questions. The second case study I wanted to go through was also another government department working on a policy a very controversial new policy in the planning space. And um, it, it was a difficult project for them, um, you know, talk about vested interests, nothing is more vested when you're talking about planning and properties and uh, certainly in some countries, certainly in Australia, I think same in the US and many other countries, right? So very controversial topic and um, uh, quite a complex change to the policy. This uh, government agency was not using our software, right? And they had about 5,000 submissions. And part of their policy was that they would publish submissions 
publicly on the website for transparency because you know this is that kind of particular sector is quite rife with a bit of um i won't say corruption but certainly there were deceptions of corruption so they wanted to be very transparent about it um there were a whole lot of community groups who weren't so confident about the government uh, agency analyzing the feedback meaningfully and coming to the right conclusions so they decided to do their own analysis of the submissions and they contacted a number of academics um, asking for help and some of them recommended them to us so they came to us and um you know took advantage i guess of the not-for-profit discount that we we had and they used our software to do their own analysis of the government of the, those submissions right now classic David and Goliath situation where you've got a government agency with enormous resources, huge number of consultants going through these 5,000 plus submissions. And then you've got a, a scrappy community group um, run by volunteers, uh, people not super te technically savvy and trying to, you know, do the same thing really and, and test out the accuracy of the government's evaluation. They had to be more strategic in what they were looking at. So that was the key. Um, they they couldn't do all 5,000 and they couldn't do it. They had a different objective, right? So that our advice to them early on was be strategic. What are you looking for? And um, the process, you know, the, the, the whole project was running late. The, it was delayed. The report hadn't come out. And then um, the minister in charge of politician came out and um, made a had a big media briefing saying, look, we've had heaps of submissions, they're very complex, and, and they were, some of them were hundreds of pages long, right? Um, the team is still evaluating them, but one thing is clear, nobody agrees on anything. Um, the people, you know, like, dislike, lots of different parts of it. So we're, we're pretty much on track. We're probably gonna just keep going with this draft policy because it's clear that it's, you know, everyone's got some, some issues, but not, terrible issues and um, unfortunately the minister the community group came out the next day with their own media and they were fairly media savvy and they were able to say well the minister's actually quite wrong uh, there's common agreement by normally opposing parties so they had uh, you know the legal academics the property council like the industry groups the environmental groups Greenpeace, all of these people, all of these groups that typically would be quite uh, opposed in their positions, but they were able to say all of them agree on these three things, that these three things are wrong in the policy. And, you know, they were able to not only demonstrate that, uh, you know, pick out that that was true, but they were able to provide the quotes from Greenpeace, from the academics from you know the industry bodies saying this is what we don't like about it and um you know it was uh, they ended up sort of the, the policy had to be abandoned so they definitely won that um argument but the i think what happened from the government point of view is that there were so many submissions they didn't have adequate tools to look for those areas of common ground or areas of common dissension and they were not able to pick out those patterns. They didn't see the forest with the trees. They were so focused on the trees, they didn't notice that there were some really important patterns in the feedback and in the data, and how do we pick them out easily and quickly and act on them. So for me, there were you know, two, the two really interesting case studies, right, in, from, in that policy context, because they show you the power of data and they show you why you need to sort of have good tools as well to help you get through it. But starting, you, you need to start with a good framework and a good idea of how you're gonna measure success before you get too far into your project, or you're never going to be able to really, you know, analyze it well. So best practice, um, I think, if we look at some of the frameworks we have in our stakeholder engagement industry themselves, so things like the IAP2 spectrum. So this is the International Association of Public Participation. Most of you, I'm sure, will be very familiar with it. It's a framework that's been around for a long time. There's a lot I don't like about this framework, but there's a lot that you know still holds true. I think the reason I put it up here today was I thought, you know, going back to that idea that 
um, policy and programs are often done in a very um, politicised environment um, where you don't have an opportunity to change much always. Sometimes there's almost no opportunity to change anything. So I think the spectrum is interesting. So from, in that context of saying, well, where is our, you know, just honestly, where is our policy sitting? Where is this program sitting? Is it is there any opportunity for us to collaborate and empower people to make decisions on it? Or are we really at a stage where we can do nothing but just inform them that it's happening? They don't have a choice in it. The best we can do is just keep them informed. All right, so uh, it's just good to refer to this, identify where, where you are and where you could be on in your project. Then we look at some of the other frameworks that we like as well, you know, like Equator Principles and IFC um, Performance Standards. Um, they have some key indicators for effective community engagement. And some of those things we, um, you know, that are like in here that we look at, you know, um, stakeholder identification analysis, who needs to be involved in this process, um, free and informed consultation, informed participation, that capacity building, consultation with vulnerable groups, um, and then feedback, letting people know how their participation, um, you know, was used and informed the process and outcomes. This is an evaluation framework I developed quite a few years ago. Um, I think it, um, well, we, um, there was a United Nations um, conference on community engagement, the first one. Out of that came this Brisbane Declaration, which kind of I was pretty involved in helping write. And after that, I thought, well, how can we take that definition? We, we did a very short little consultation across you know, the industry globally to say, well, what are the different frameworks people use for defining good uh, community engagement or stakeholder engagement? And we try to bring them all together into one, because one of the challenges our industry faces is that we don't have those common definitions and terminology and stuff. Um, so we brought them together into these six principles that were in the Brisbane Declaration. And then I took what was in the Brisbane Declaration and said, how can we create an evaluation framework out of that so that it can be practicable, practical and usable? Okay, so six indicators were integrity, inclusion, deliberation. Remember that is like coming up in that other um, framework we looked at, influence, capacity and sustainable decisions, right? And and so what does that mean? What do we mean by, you know, influence? Uh, is it that they, is it only a success if they've been able to change it? Well, not necessarily. Could, you know, what we're looking at from a practical point of view is people have an input in how they participate and that we can demonstrate, you know, how their participation um, was reflected in the policy or in the, the actual outcomes, right? So same with integrity. Being, open and honest about the scope of it. If uh, the scope is limited to just informing people and you have absolutely no chance that anyone could influence anything on, on the actual policy, it's too political, then let's be honest about it. Let's not ask people, do you like this policy? What would you change? Because we don't have the capacity to actually change it, right? So I think this framework um, still kind of holds true and has some value. We have a whole ebook on our website. So if you want to read more about it, please go to our website, download it and have a look. And so finally, um, three practical tips for success, right? So the first thing I would say is just get started. Have a plan for evaluation and analysis. This is often the missing piece. People launch into um, these processes and they don't have a clear idea of how they're gonna analyze the data, how are they going to evaluate it? How are they going to define success? Um, I see this time and time again with processes, um, you know, right across different industry sectors, but particularly in relation to policy and program delivery. Um, good data will overcome most objections and roadblocks. You can't argue with the data if you've got it, right? But getting good data is a key. Getting a ton of data, you know, and you're missing the forest with the trees. So it's not about quantity, it's about having a plan in place of how you're going to deal with that data when it comes in. Being strategic, so focusing on the most important things, um, only ask questions if you're prepared to use the answer. We see um, so many, um, thanks Gil, thanks for coming along. Um, glad you enjoyed the session. Um, we see 
the submission forms that are literally hundreds of questions long and how do you you know first of all how do you expect people to even respond to that at that level of detail um it's i feel like it's disrespectful of people's time to even ask them to do that and then are you actually going to use that information right so better submission forms is my third and most practical tip for you is focus on the forms how are people going to give you the feedback because more more often than not we're asking for written feedback on these processes and one of the easiest things you can do to really improve all of this is to create a better form um, some of the worst case examples i've seen of submission forms uh, as i said hundreds of questions long uh, i think the worst one was a, yeah 140 questions something um, and the questions are not meaningful Right, it was long, they were complex. Um, I, I think in one case it was like, because uh, it was on a policy, it was like, do you agree with clause 1.1? If yes, why? If no, why? Do you agree with clause 1.2.1? Well, you know, and it's, and so it went, and it was just like, it was horrific. It was, it was so complex and it had required people to keep going back. Um, so not only was it onerous to fill out, but it was, um, you know, one of my questions to that team doing it was like, what happens if everyone says, no, we disagree with it? Are you going to change it? Um, by asking the question in that form, you're setting an expectation that it could be changed. So, of course, I'm going to say, no, I hate everything. Don't do anything, right? Or, yes, I love it all. Do it all because I want it all, right? What is the... Um, what are the areas of common ground or what are the trade-offs people are willing to make? Because often these things are difficult and perhaps nobody wants any of it, but maybe we need to trade off in, for some other benefit. So how can we frame our questions to identify those key themes, the key areas of common ground? You've got a policy that has, you know, 200, 300 clauses to it. Are all of those going to be relevant to people? Or are there three or four big, chunky um, pieces of information that are going to be controversial people are going to want to talk about so focus on those and then give people an opportunity to comment on anything else right here's the three most important things we need to know let's ask those questions first and then have the question saying what else do you want to talk about right so the form you design needs to be able to give you meaningful and actionable insights um, don't forget to include things like demographics, so location, uh, depending on your work, it might be some other characteristics like age or, um, you know, industry. So it really depends on what you're working on. And then what information, what other information do you need um, to for, for people to make an informed response, but also for you to understand their response? Um, it's a whole other topic. We're probably going to run another webinar just on forms at some stage this year. So if you're not on our mailing list, sign up for it if this is of interest to you, because it is something that I see consistently fairly poor practice right across our industry. I'm, I'm sorry to say, and I'm not saying this from a, you know, wanting to be hypercritical about this, but just I think there's so much better we can do and, and we could save time, be more efficient with with how we deal with this data, but also get better insights, right? And uh, it's going to be a win-win for everyone if we can get better doing this. So uh, look out for that. Uh, I don't think we have a date for it as yet, but it's certainly on our, our plans for this year. And uh, with that, I'm going to bring this to a close. If you've got any questions or comments or feedback, uh, I'd love for you to pop it into the chat. This was quite a kind of dense presentation. Uh, a fair amount of content. So I'm, I'm interested to know how you found that. Was that too much? Was it a little bit too academic? Um, give me some feedback, right? We've got to practice what we preach towards stakeholder engagement and feedback. Um, so give me some feedback. Let me know what you think. Was this useful? Would you like to see more of them or less? So I'll look out for your chats. Uh, your messages in the chat and um, with that I will thank you for joining us we really appreciate your time we hope you got some useful insights out of this session and um, stay in touch with us with um, if you want to find out more about you know us our software please get in touch uh, our team will get in touch with you after the 
um, the session today, but um, check out our website. We've got tons of resources on there as well that uh, we keep creating for the industry. Thank you very much, everybody. So everybody being very quiet with their comments and feedback. Thank you for those of you who participated in the chat. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Manoj. Thanks, Wilfred. Glad you guys found it useful. Well, enjoy the rest of your day and uh, hope to see you at um, one of our next sessions. Thanks, Isabella. Great to see you here again as well. Bye-bye, everyone.